So today we're in the Gospel of John, chapter 4. Um, last time we studied through verse 45, so I'll pick it up at verse 46 and read through verse 54. As we see a, another major sign of Jesus' divinity recorded in the Gospel of John. Um, I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. This, so we're Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 46. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. He then inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. Now, there are seven different signs that John essentially calls signs and that are recorded in, uh, in this gospel. Um, this is the second one, although we've seen a lot of what I would call miracles and wonders happening in different ways. Um, he calls this the second sign. So, um, you know, to, to me it's, uh, well, the first one, of course, is the wedding, at the wedding in Cana. Um, well, and, and while this particular miraculous sign is more open than the one at the wedding, uh, we're not even sure before it happened or while it was happening, if people even realized that Jesus was turning water into wine. We, we saw that happen afterwards. But that was really pretty low key, and, and this was fairly low key, but it's more public. Uh, by now, there were more crowds following him, um, and the nobleman, no doubt, was coming to Jesus, uh, wanting to bring him back. He was saying, come to my son. Probably, most likely, uh, had an entourage with him, Was had food, had transportation, uh, if they had donkeys, extra donkeys, you know, to, for Jesus, and uh, say, come on, we're going to take you to Capernaum because I want my son healed. So we're seeing more people around, and then more people heard Jesus say this, and of course, even though Jesus stayed there in Cana, while the nobleman's, uh, nobleman went back home and uh, heard about his son being healed on the way, uh, of course, everybody's wondering, what happened? What happened? And so I'm sure word got back uh, into Cana very quickly as to what had happened. So, you know, this sign is a little more open. Uh, later on, the signs will end up becoming more public. Uh, they'll affect more people in some cases. They'll be more spectacular, so to speak, uh, in, in some of the cases. And some of them, as we will study, start to, to study next time, uh, actually start to draw hostility from the local religious leaders. I heard somebody uh, in the last few days say that someone came up to him, knew he was teaching the Bible, and looked at him and said, you know, I really, I really can't stand religious people. And the man said back to him, you know, I can't stand religious people either. <laughs> and, you know, this was a Christian saying this, and, and he, he kind of was like, oh, I'm glad to hear you say that. Why don't you like religious people? And they got into a conversation and the man ended up accepting Christ because they both had in common, they didn't like people that were religious. Now, you know, we're not talking about Christian brothers and sisters. We're talking about people that are religious, that, that you know, they wear it on their sleeve or they're, they have a religion, but as the Bible describes, there's not power in that religion. It's not Jesus that they have. They just have a form of, of, a, of godliness. So I'll, I'll get off that rabbit trail and <laughs> jump back into here. Uh, in, in this specific sign that we have, we see a few things we haven't seen before. And we see royalty involved. Uh, we see a nobleman 
this interacting with Jesus. So we haven't seen royalty involved before. Um, something else that's really important is that uh, the sign was a result uh, of belief being rooted in trusting faith. And we'll cover, get into that a little bit more. And also the, de the beneficiary of the blessing of the sign was not even in the same place, was not in the same location as Jesus was. And I think this is a significant in showing the miraculous work of God is not limited by the location of either the person asking God, asking Jesus for the favor, nor the physical presence of Christ being where the blessing will occur at. So let's take a look at the setting. Uh, verse four begins, so Jesus came to Cana of Galilee where he had made water wine. Um, as we read last time, the Jesus, uh, Jesus and his disciples are being well received in Galilee. Word has spread that he was in Galilee and he was coming through Galilee. Um, we're not told how long they'd been in Cana, but we know it had to have been at least a few days by this point in time. Uh, and, and we see in verse 46, it says, there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Now we know this because this government official and it's likely someone closely connected to King Herod. We're not sure exactly what his position is, but he, he lived in Capernaum, had a son that was very sick, near death. Obviously, the official had heard that Jesus was coming, had hoped he would come to Capernaum because his boy was about, he was sick and, and coming close to death. But obviously, he'd heard that he was staying in Cana. So it took a couple of days for word to travel. You know, they didn't text back then. You know, they didn't just, hey, hey Jesus is now passing First Street in Cana. No, they didn't, they didn't have that. Uh, so word had to travel by messengers or, or just by people talking to each other as they were traveling through. So uh, he got word, uh, Jesus was there. It was 16 miles away as the crow flies. But the crow does not fly very good directly straight over the mountains <laughs> and down around the lake, uh, uh, Lake Genesaret or, or the Sea of Galilee. Uh, it was actually for, for people walking or on donkeys or, or you know, transporting. Foot travel was more like 30 miles in this case. And it was um, a, a day's journey in that time was between 20 and 30 miles a day just uh, by an individual. So this was either a one or two day journey away. So likely it took a couple days for word to get to Capernaum that Jesus was in Cana, then another day or two for the official to realize that Jesus was not where he wanted him to be. So it took a couple days for him to go to find Jesus in Cana and met him there about one o'clock in the afternoon of this day. Um, now somebody, you know, maybe David, maybe you know exactly what day, what day and time it was. I haven't studied it out that much, but we, we do know it was one o'clock in, in that particular day. But by this time, you know, it had been a while. He was desperate for his son who was dying as he left him. And now time was running out. And we see in verse 47, when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. The nobleman was begging Jesus to come and heal his son. Yeah, I, I got to thinking, what, what are you willing to do to see God work a miracle in the life of someone that you love? Are you willing to humble yourself and beg God for a miracle? Ask God for a miracle. This man took off work to, to come and see Jesus. Um, I'm assuming uh, probably for a few days traveling to Canaan and back. Probably <laughs> took servants with him. We know he had servants. We talked about him carrying the extra food, supplies, and, and transportation. How many days are you willing to devote yourself to petitioning God and asking God for a favor on behalf of a loved one? How many of your resources are you willing to put in, to devote to the Lord in this service. No, I'm not asking for you to send a monthly offering in. Okay, that's not where I'm going. But just think about, you know, what of you are you going to devote to the Lord to see that happen, to see something happen? And, you know, this nobleman had no guarantees, even though he's investing a lot in trying to get his son healed. He had no guarantees that nothing, that anything would happen. He just had a simple faith that Jesus would come back with him 
and personally heal his son if he was able to make it in time. Our life lesson here is actually a question. Do you believe that Jesus will help you when you ask him to do so? And do you believe that he'll help you in time? Do you believe that Jesus will help you when you ask him to do so? And do you believe that he'll do it, that he'll help you in time? Well, let's see how Jesus responded to this, this desperate plea. Jesus said to him in verse 48, Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. Somehow I don't think this is the response the nobleman was wanting to hear um, or expected to hear from Jesus this day. After all, this was an important man. He was a, a nobleman, a high official. He was worthy of getting attention from anybody in the land. And of course, from Jesus, right? So was Jesus' remark here inappropriate or maybe even a bit rude? So Jesus said, unless you people see signs and wonders. Now, this is one reason I, I like studying in the New King James uh, for a, just an ordinary mortal man. It's very clear. The translation is clear to me for today. He's speaking to the crowd. Um, and by implication of it being recorded in the gospel, it applies to everyone else as well. You people. It applies to all of us. Um, Another translation I like, the King James, uh, says, except ye see signs and wonders. And ye, you know, we don't use that a lot. So most people probably don't realize that that's a, that's a, a plural word in Old English, speaking to a person or more than one person or a crowd or, or anyone who would ever read or hear that. So anyway, another little side trip there. And that's why I like reading, studying in, in the scripture because he wasn't just talking to the nobleman, he was talking to everybody that was around. Uh, as we know, the crowds were around him wherever he went, so we can, sure, we can be sure there was a crowd out here listening to Jesus, and listening to him teaching. When this man came up to him, they were waiting for his, his response. And they'd either seen or heard about him turning to the water into wine right there in their own village, in their own town. They're anxious for another sign. Hey, look, this guy's asking for a miracle. Here's a big chance. Was Jesus going to take off to Capernaum and show another great healing miracle? You know, today we'd have a, we put a tent up and have a big revival meeting. Okay, everybody come watch the, watch the miracles take place. So, you know, they're kind of getting anxious for this thing. Um, as it turns out, that's not what happened. No, instead he said, he's chiding them for not believing unless they got to see signs and wonders. They should believe through his word, not through the signs and wonders. I mean, it was terrible, wasn't it? I mean, didn't I say a little while back that, that Jesus did these things, the signs and wonders and miracles because he had compassion on people and because he loved the people? That's why he did these things. But now he's scolding them because they wanted to see these things. Well, in reality, his response was designed to teach us right here, right now, today, about him. Our life lesson, here's what you can learn from it. When, you, when we pray for others, don't do it so you can see a miracle or to receive a spiritual credit for praying for that. But do it out of love and compassion for them. When you pray for others, don't do it so you can see a miracle or receive spiritual credit for praying, but do it out of love and compassion for them. You know, I don't know about you, but I, I catch myself uh, trying to get a little bit of spiritual credit sometimes. You know, something good happens to somebody and it's like, hey, I was praying for you. Look what I did. I know you never do that. But sometimes it's, you know, you just have to say, thank you, Lord, praise the Lord that he's had compassion, he's had love for you because that's really the truth of what's, what's happening there. So anyway, Jesus tells everybody, unless you see these signs and wonders, you're not gonna believe, are you? What's the nobleman's response? I mean, does he try to convince Jesus? No, 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 Jesus, I really do believe. Or maybe 
He'll believe, Jesus, I believe in you, even if you don't come and even if you don't heal my son, I'll still believe. Does he try to convince him of that? Or, or does he get into a philosophical discussion of you know, the, the way signs and wonders affect the psychology of belief? You know, kind of a, kind of a psychology for today uh, thing. No, he doesn't get into any of that. His plea in prayer to Jesus. And that's all, that's all that prayer is. Uh, sometimes if you're wondering, it's not like, you know, putting flowers on and speaking in a different voice or, or anything like that. It's just simply talking to God. And sometimes that prayer is a plea to God. Sometimes it's a crying to God. Sometimes just chatting with him. But it was short and sweet. Verse 49, the nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. And then verse 50, Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. That's it. No loading up the donkeys to, to go to Capernaum for Jesus and, and his crew. No entourage, no travel. Your son lives. And it was done. The crowd didn't need to see it happen. There wasn't any questioning or reasoning why Jesus should heal the son or even talk about the nobleman's belief in Jesus or didn't even talk about what church he attended <laughs> or if it was God's will or what the boy had done. What, what did he do to get so sick to start with? He deserves being sick. No, no, none of that. Jesus already knew the man's heart. His words were for all of us to learn. The nobleman simply wanted to be healed and he believed Jesus was from God and had the power to heal. And he believed that Jesus would heal the boy. This noble one would, would really, I had so many questions as I was studying this. Uh, he'd be a great one to talk to in heaven. You know, I, I don't know what he was really thinking at this point. Um, and I don't even know his name at this point either, but it, you know, in looking around, it could be Chusa. He was a steward of Herod Antipas up in that area. Um, and if that's the case, if this actually was Chupas, I mean Chusa, uh, it may explain why his wife, Joanna, helped provide for Jesus. Over in Luke 8, 1 to 3, it said, And it came to pass afterwards that Jesus, that he, Jesus, went through every village and city, preaching and bringing glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, his disciples, and certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, out of whom come seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their substance. So these were Jesus' supporters that were his followers and you know, people that had, you know, they had to have some kind of money to, <laughs> to be able to live as they were uh, following uh, Rabbi Jesus. And, and uh, I'm just, you know, my mind was just thinking, you know, this could be the person. It could be the impetus. You know, Jesus kept their son from dying. Why not help out his ministry and, and help spread the word? So, you know, if, if this was the man, uh, even if it wasn't, if it was some, some other nobleman, he probably had the political and military authority to actually command Jesus to come with him. That's another aspect of it. You know, he could have been saying, Sir, come down before my child dies. And expecting, you know, Jesus to jump. I don't know. So we'll find out in eternity. But it may have meant, uh, you know, what we saw as a simple request may have been a command. I don't know. But if you caught me when I read verse 50, I didn't read all of verse 50. I know y'all are following along with me. So let me read the whole verse. It says, Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke. We know he had hoped. We know he believed. But now his faith was put to the test. Did he trust Jesus? <clears throat> if the boy is that close to death, we know there's no time for him to make another trip to come back or to go get the boy and try to bring him, anything like that, the boy probably couldn't have made the trip or he would have brought him to him. But either he trusts Jesus, will heal his son without him being taken there, or he doesn't. 
Walking away without Jesus right by his side would require the man to trust Christ's healing power. <clears throat> to trust Christ's healing power and the words that he spoke. <clears throat> now, isn't that what true biblical faith is all about anyway? We're back to one of the foundational verses of this gospel. <clears throat> John 1, verse 12. But to as many as did receive and welcome him, he gave the right, the authority, the privilege to become the children of God. That is, to those who believe in, adhere to, trust in, and rely on his name. Now, as it turns out, that's exactly the kind of belief this man had. He believes in his heart and mind that Jesus can heal. More important, he is willing to trust Jesus to make good on his word without having absolute proof in his hands. This man acts in faith and heads back home. He trusts Jesus, and soon we'll see his faith rewarded. Now, we've got a really long life lesson here. Refill your, your pens or pencils. Life lesson for us today is trust Jesus. Trust Jesus. Now, we're going to see this more as we go through the gospel. Jesus tells someone to do something that doesn't make sense. But when they obey... It makes perfect sense. In chapter two, he told his servants, he told the servants there, fill up the pots of water and then take them to the master of the feast. And not such a great idea since the master was expecting fine wine or at least decent wine. And, and yet we see what happened. In the next chapter, chapter five, he'll say something that seems actually a little bit on the cruel side. He's gonna tell a man, I'll give you a preview. He's gonna tell a man that's been lame for 38 years. He just goes up to him and tells him, well, he talks to him a little bit, and then he says, get up, take up your bed and walk. I mean, that guy's lame. <laughs> Doesn't make sense. Later on, we'll see him even telling a dead man to get up and come out of the tomb. And we'll see him telling one of his own disciples to get out of a perfectly good boat and walk across the water to come to him. Okay, that's how Jesus works. When he tells you to do something, whether you think it's possible or not, it is possible. And you can trust Jesus. And you can obey his command and do what he tells you to. Because it's not your power, it's Jesus' power working through you. So this nobleman was going back home without Jesus. Verse 51 says, as he was going as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, your son lives. Now, this is actually, this meeting <clears throat> actually took place the next day after his conversation with Jesus. And remember, even though he was traveling north from Cana up through Capernaum, the Bible accurately recorded that he was going down. You see, Cana was 330 feet above sea level, and Capernaum was... 682 feet below sea level. So uh, in addition to a journey of 10 to 30, I mean 20 to 30 miles, he was going down in elevation over a thousand feet. So as he was traveling, I kind of wonder what was going through his mind. Again, a nice conversation with this man would be interesting in heaven. You know, I wonder if he's rejoicing with his comrades and those traveling with him, full of confidence that your, his son was okay and healed. <clears throat> Jesus healed my son. I can't wait to see my son. You know, he's, he's, he's whole again. This is going to be really good. If you had all that, all that confidence. Or if it was a pity party, you know. You know, this guy is a Messiah, but he wouldn't even come and even see my son. I told him he twice. I told him he's dying. He's near death and he didn't even come. What am I going to do? You know, kind of seems to have fallen apart. I don't know, you know, he'd, he'd gone to, maybe it was a failure, personal failure he was thinking. I'm gone, I'm a noble person, I'm, I, you know, I got this group, I'm, I want to bring my son back to Jesus and he wouldn't even do it for me. You know, what a Herod's nobleman. Or maybe it was just quiet. <laughs> Sometimes after, after meeting with Jesus, or after a particularly uh, uh, interesting uh, time that you've had with the Lord, you're just quiet, trying to be reflecting, and I'm not sure what to say. Well, you know, this, this man was uh, 
obviously had and understood authority, he was now subjected to an even higher authority than he'd ever known before. And he knew that when a king gave a command, it was to be done. Now suddenly, as they're, they're traveling down, one of his companions says, look over here, look down there. And he saw some of his own servants coming up to meet him. Now, this guy didn't just fall off a turnip truck yesterday, <laughs> all right? Uh, he knew when he saw his own servants that there was either some very bad news that they were bringing to him and were gonna tell him, hey, they knew he planned to bring Jesus back. And they were gonna tell him, hey, take Jesus back to where he was, your son's gone, it's too late. Or the same thing, take Jesus back because the son got better on his own. Those are the two choices that you would normally have. But we know what happened. In this case, he knew if Jesus was really the long-awaited Messiah and his words were true, which he did seem to trust in, and he said, your son lives, then his life would change forever. He wanted to believe. He knew it had to have been an amazing recovery if they came out, you know, a very quick recovery if they were coming out to meet him so soon. And he also knew that his servants would have had to left would have had to leave somewhere the, the day before to meet him at that point on the journey. But he wanted to be sure. So in verse 52, he says, Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. His hopes were confirmed. His son was alive and well. And Jesus had demonstrated his authority over sickness and death. And that his commands were not limited like man's commands. They weren't limited to, to phys physical locations. Um, you know, just a side note here. The same hour, we our hours are different. Generally, uh, the, the hour started at 6 a.m. It was zero hour. And then seven was one hour, the first hour. And, you know, up through. That's why we, we extrapolate that. When he says the seventh hour, that was actually at one o'clock in the afternoon, somewhere in that time frame. But he knew that in the instant, right in that instant, after he was begging Jesus to come heal his son, and then a moment later, Jesus said, go your way, your son lives. Somehow, some way, the power of God through Jesus healed his dying son. Uh, that's, that's exciting to know that that happens. And Jesus had not changed. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, according to the word of God. So what are the results? I find it very interesting that we, we know the new nobleman knew that Jesus could heal. And, uh, you know, it reminded me back again to the, the process of faith and believing. The historical aspect or the factual aspect of faith is he'd seen Jesus heal people before or heard reports of it happening. This gave him enough faith to make the journey to heal his son. This need for healing and knowing Jesus could heal revealed a personal aspect of his faith. He personally believed. We know he asked Jesus for help and, and he heard and heeded the words that Jesus spoke to him. So this is where the word of God being spoken to, to him uh, comes and brought more faith into his life. And Jesus didn't ask him to do anything for his son to be healed. He didn't ask for a donation. Uh, I believe the noble, nobleman you know, obviously offered him transportation, food to come and see him. He probably would have given him money if he'd asked for it, but he didn't ask for any of that. Jesus only asked for him to go his way and trust, and trust that his son will be healed. I think that is, that is a really practical aspect of faith in Jesus. It's just saying, what you've asked has been done. Just trust has been done. Go see your son. Jesus only asked him to do that. Here, and in, and in verse 53, we see that not only the nobleman believed, but it says, and he himself believed and his whole household believed. Now, that's a sign, that's a really good continuing sign that they, he really did trust in Jesus. That trust was extended to his entire household. Now, in in that day, you know, it wasn't just 
him, his wife, and his kids, like it is in most of our households today. I mean, his household included probably the servants, and we know he had servants, um, may have included extended family. So everybody that was there, the man exuded. <laughs> he, he just, you know, his faith and belief was so strong that it spread to everybody in his household. And he led the household. I thought that was pretty, pretty neat. Him, he himself believed and his whole household. Um, Be in my house, I will serve the Lord. It's probably a declar declaration that he, he could make in that, that uh, situation. And you know, that's kind of a, a full circle way that uh, we see an early example of how belief in Jesus goes through these various levels of faith as the, the, the Lord wants all of us to, to experience and be a part of. And he himself believed in his whole household. Wow. I'm going to look at his household again in a moment, but look at verse 54. It says, this again is the second sign that Jesus did when he had come out of Judea in the Galilee. And I think the second sign, we know he'd done other wonders. I think it's referring to the second time the people here in Cana of Galilee had seen the power of God working through Jesus in a supernatural way right in front of them. And a sign that would show that this is the divine son of God. We've seen John recording that there are many other miracles and wonders. So it wasn't just the second time that Jesus showed his power and, and his divinity um, and ministered to the needy people during this time. So just kind of kind of clear that up because John only shows seven signs in his entire gospel. And I know there's more than seven things that Jesus did in his, in his uh, uh, ministry. Let me go back to the noble, nobleman's household again. Again, we're not sure how many or how extensive this man's household was, but we do know that he had to have been, uh, you know, an extension somehow in King Herod's uh, authority. We know Herod was not, uh, in any sense of the word, a godly man at all. But this nobleman was one of several that were recorded in the Gospels that came to faith in Jesus, yet served in high places in a fairly corrupt government. The reason I mention this is because, brothers and sisters, we need godly men and women in high places. We need not to hold back in sharing our faith and praying for those who put them in authority over us. This is very important, especially in these last days. Let's pray that our leaders not only believe that there is God, but know that Jesus is God. They understand and trust the Bible. They apply it to the personal and political aspects of their lives and by extension to the life of the nation. That's the only hope that our country ever will have, ever has had, and ever will have. And finally, that, that those in power over us and authority over us would fully trust God and his promises and that they would not lead, lead to their own devices, but really trust in the word of God. And it's true, it's true for us today as it was when God spoke to Solomon back in 2 Chronicles. In chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, God said to, to Solomon, When I shut up the heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, how is that going to happen in the United States of America? I don't know. You know, the nobleman didn't know how it was going to happen for his son. But we're told not to lean to our own understanding in all our ways, acknowledge God, and let's let him do it. Let's just start with that in all of our ways. God loved us enough that he sent Jesus to let us cap capture a glimpse of his glory. Mankind saw a bit more glory in these signs and, and many other events. And uh, it's the same glory that we can experience in our relationship with God. I like Matthew 5, 6, it says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Seek righteousness in your own life and encourage others to seek righteousness in their lives. Hunger and thirst are pretty strong words, um, especially in our, our day. You, know, probably, you probably can't remember the last time that you were really hungry or really thirsty. 
but let spiritual hunger and thirst drive your lives towards Jesus. There are others around us that are depending on it because they are starving to death for the word of God. They're starving to death for, you know, hungering to death, thirsty to hear what God has for them. And, and we have the answers. First John 3, verses 1 to 3, we're told, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone that has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Again, hunger, thirst for righteousness. Fill yourself up, feast on his love. In 1 John 5 to 7, uh, 1 John 1, 5 to 7 uh, tells us that God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sins. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is how we begin our walk with Jesus and it's how we keep up our walk with Jesus. The free gift of God, eternal life. If you're missing fellowship with God, same thing. It applies to us. And so I wanna just encourage you to keep that relationship with God up to date. If there's unforgiven sin in your life, ask God to forgive it and ask him to continue to cleanse you from that unrighteousness. Seek hunger, thirst for that righteousness in your life every day, all day long. <laughs> Sometimes I say every day and it's like, well, starting about four in the afternoon, you know, after you've already messed up. No, no, it's just, it's great to start in the morning, <laughs> just all day long. And, uh, you know, I just, just encourage you, you know, whether you're here or whether you're listening on, on the recording, um, you know, seek God, continue to seek God and his righteousness. I want to bless you as we finish up today. Just as Aaron was told to bless the people of Israel, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thank you for coming today. Thank you all for listening today. Uh, we'll see you next week, next time. Uh, hopefully next week as we uh, continue teaching in the Gospel of John, uh, starting in chapter 5. And remember, if there's anything you'd like for us to pray with you about, uh, please see one of us uh, after the, at, at this time. Uh, or email us, uh, text or, or write or call, and we'll be glad to, to do that for you. God bless you. Thank you for being here.